Have they proved it? No. So what are we talking about? Well, someone that believes in an old earth has to believe these rocks and fossils were laid down over long, slow periods of time. If you believe that, if you believe the rocks and the fossils were laid down over long, slow periods of time, then look what you can see. At the bottom of the rocks, you have marine invertebrates. And then millions of years later, as you go up, you see fish. So obviously, the clams and all those kind of critters evolved into the fish over millions of years. And you go up a little further, and you see where the fish came up on the sandbar and said, I can breathe, and he turned into a frog. And you can see over billions of years that the frog turned into a lizard, and the lizard turned into a bird, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do you see what they're seeing? Satan is a good liar. He's good at what he does. Don't ever be fooled. You are on the winning team, but Satan's good at what he does. He makes things look good. They look at this and go, hey, it's evidence for evolution. I want you to be aware, if evolution actually occurred, there should be some half lizard, half birds. There should be some half fish, half frogs. There aren't any. They're called missing links because they're still missing. Here, Professor T.L. Moore, who's a vocal evolutionist, tells us the more one studies the fossil record, the more certain one becomes that evolution is based upon faith alone. There is no really good supporting evidence. They'll come up with them and put them in National Geographic, and then if you watch within a couple months at the back of the magazine, they'll take them back away again because there'll be evidence that undermines what they were trying to say. There really are no what are called transitional fossils. You'll learn about that in, in biology when you get there. Okay, this is also how they date the Earth. They date the Earth by the rocks and the fossils. How they do that is they say, well, these rocks take millions and millions of years to be laid down, and so how would we date them? Well, we're going to date them by the fossils found in them. Oh, and I want you to know, when they put the dates on the geologic column, they put them on there over 100 years before they had radiometric dating. So never think that these dates were set up by potassium argon dating, uranium lead dating, carbon-14 dating. These dates were put on them before those techniques were ever worked out. What they did was they said, well, we'll pick an index fossil. This is a this is a fictitious, it's a fake trilobite fossil. If I really had a trilobite fossil this big, it would have cost me hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and I'm not rich. So this is a fake one, okay? Um, but this is supposed to be a trilobite fossil. Trilobites are only found in a very low rock layer. And let's say we found this trilobite fossil in New York State, then you could, you could date anything all the way to California that was found in that same layer by this fossil. It's an index fossil. They date the whole rock layer by the index fossil. And these rock layers, I told you, are continental in, shell, uh, in size and some bigger than that. They go across the oceans. And so how do we date the fossil? That should be our next question. Well, we date the rock by the fossil that's found in it. We date the fossil by when they believe it evolved. And then they prove evolution by the date on the rock. If you do this at home, your parents will punish you. I just want to give you the heads up. This is called a tautology or circular reasoning. And this is not good science. It is not, a, a, it, there's no starting place, unless of course you believe evolution is true in the first place. Now I, I, I've gotten in trouble with some pastors with this one. Because there are pastors, uh, no, I would just say this. The pastors that believe that the earth is old, believe it because of the rocks and the fossils and they think the geologists have proved it. So I've said to some of those pastors, well, do you believe in evolution? Well, no, of course not. They don't believe in evolution. These are good Christian pastors. They've just been confused by the science. I'm not mad at them. I'm sad for them. They've been confused by the science. And I say, do you believe in evolution? They go, no. And I go, then why do you believe the earth is old? Because you know what? If you don't believe in evolution, there is no evidence for an old earth. I want you to drill that into your brains. If there is no evolution, there is no evidence for an old earth because that is how they date the rocks and the fossils by when they think things evolved. So people that believe, don't believe in evolution, but do believe the earth is old, don't realize that they can't have it both ways. Scientists know that. The ministries that are out there, and I'm not going to name them because I don't want to get sued, but the ministries that are out there that are saying they're creation ministries, but they believe everything is old, they will tell you the flood never covered the entire planet. You know why? Because they're scientists and they know they can't have it both ways. See, either the flood covered the planet, made all the rocks and the fossils, and the earth is young, so either the fossils and rocks were laid down over long, slow periods of time and the earth is old, or the fossils and the rocks were laid down in the great flood and the earth is young. 
Hang on just a sec. It's got to be one of those two ways. And I want you to know it's not just me telling you this. This is a quote from uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, which is not real creation friendly. And it tells us it can not be denied that from a strictly philosophical standpoint, geologists are here arguing in a circle. The succession of organisms has been determined by the study of their remains embedded in the rocks. And the relative ages of the rocks are determined by the remains of the organisms they contain. They're telling you exactly what I just said. And they don't like us very well in Encyclopedia Britannica. Okay? I've, I've known people got saved this way. I know a chemical engineer on the other coast that when somebody challenges him with this and he went and he looked, up, looked at it for himself, he actually accepted the Lord and now he's an outspoken creationist. Because people aren't aware that that's what they've accepted. Yes? So you said that uh, evolution scientists, they find one um, like fossil and then in that same layer they'll say, okay, just because this is in the same layer, they will Everything is dated by that, absolutely. Okay. And, but how did they find the actual date for the first fossil? They put a date on it that when they believe it evolved. It's totally based on when it's they believe it evolved. totally guessing. Yes. But they don't consider it guesswork because if you talk to an evolutionist, a real evolutionist will tell you evolution is a fact. What, what other excuse will they give you to... <laughs> They just will tell you evolution is a fact. And how, wh why do we know it's a fact? Because look, it's all around us. Everything's all around us. And there is no God, so evolution had to happen. Their logic is just as based on faith as ours, isn't it? Yeah. They just don't realize it. Actually, they have better faith than we do. We all, God touches our lives in so many different ways, and yet Christians will frequently not agree with God's word. Whereas the evolutionists, they'll hold solid no matter. I think we should be uh, uh, absolutely humbled by the faith that we see in evolutionists. So. so between their layers, they could say, okay, one layer, it's, I don't know, a billion years, and then the next layer is just a, a thousand years older, or it could be a million. They're, they're just totally guessing. They're just placing... Actually, them. yeah, let's go there. Let's actually go there. So when they look at the rocks and the fossils, we show evidence that there are no erosion layers between the different layers. In other words, if there was uh, one layer was laid down and then let's say a thousand years before the next layer was laid down, shouldn't you see some erosion from snow and rain and wind, right? Reality, we don't see them. We don't see any kind of erosion in between. They were obviously laid down very, very quickly, one on top of the other. Also, we see fossils that shouldn't exist if they were fossilized long and slowly. That is a fossil of a jellyfish. Jellyfish are basically water. So you'd have to fossilize them pretty quickly. That's a fossil of a shrimp. Shrimp rot very quickly and go bye-bye. And look at the details on that dude. So he had to be fossilized. Whew. Burial had to be the, the, the cause of death. And then he was fossilized very quickly. That's a fossil of an ichthyosaur. That's a marine reptile that lived um, back then. Most of us would consider those like a dinosaur type creature, okay, because it's a marine reptile. But the baby for that thing is coming out of it. You'll see on the, the far right hand side, I think I've got a circle to show you here. There it is. That's its baby. She's still in the birth canal. The poor thing was boom, buried while she was in the process of giving birth. Had she been buried long and slowly and died, that baby would have come out before she was fossilized. So there's a lot of good evidence. Matter of fact, tomorrow I'm going to show you some um, soft tissue fossilized. So the point is, it doesn't line up with the scientific facts, but the creation model with the catastrophe does. This is a polystrata tree. That tree is over 20 feet tall. Now, that's a tree that has been fossilized. If they were right, that tree would have had to stand there for millions and millions of years while the rocks built up around it. Do trees hang out for millions of years? No. So that thing had to happen very quickly. About half these trees are upside down, which means that it had to stand upside down for millions and millions of years while the rocks built up around it. Why would we see that? Because during the flood, some of these trees would get upended because of wherever the heavier end was as they're floating, they would get upended and then they would be buried and that's why we would see them fossilized this way. At the end of the flood, we're told God dropped the valleys, raised the mountains, and kept the flood waters where they're supposed to be in Psalm 104, verse 8. And we see evidence that God actually pushed these wet rock strata up because we see bent and folded rocks in mountains. Well, let's think about it. If you take a rock now and try to bend it, it shatters. It doesn't bend, does it? And yet, if you look, this is the Canadian Rockies, and look from the, the right-hand side going left. If you look at this, you can see the bends and the folds in these rocks, but they're not broken. I like this one better. This is in Canada, too. Do you see the little kids at the bottom of the picture? Those rocks are bent at a right angle. They're actually more than a right angle. And 
they're not shattered. There's all sorts of bend and fold and rock layers. Well, how could that happen unless they were bent while they were still wet? If you push them up out from underneath the water while they're still wet and then they dry, that's why that naturalist in Alaska, when she said, oh, these, these eroded off the coast of California and they were upwarped here 10 million years ago, I'm going, yeah, that's what happened. It just didn't happen 10 million years ago. <laughs> but they're seeing the same thing we are. They're seeing the same thing we are. They just are off on their time. Remember I told you that some scientists will tell you the flood never covered the entire planet. This is from National Geographic, and this guy's looking at extinct fossil corals at the summit of a mountain. We know that every high mountain was underneath the waters of the flood because we find extinct ammonites at the tops of the highest mountains. But remember, everything was under the water, and then it was pushed upward, and the water levels went down as the ocean floors, the, the, the ocean crust finally settled, and so then the water level went down, and that's why we see that. And that's important because there'll be little kids that are listening with their older brothers and sisters and they will go to their mom and they'll go oh, how did Noah and the animals breathe up there because the air is so thin and it's a really good question it's a really thinking kid that comes up with that and it's only kids that come up with that because the parents are too scared to ask those questions but they have to remember that they weren't that high up the oceans the, everything was leveled off and the mountains weren't pushed up till at the end of the flood. And so they didn't need air mass for the little giraffes and stuff. It was all good. It was, it was good. We see evidence that supports this because God, in his great mercy, sent Mount St. Helens to erupt in 1980. And when it did, it laid down finely stratified rock layers in just a few hours. And we watched it happen and it was recorded scientifically. It laid down 25 feet of very finely stratified rock layers in three hours one day. Did not take millions of years, took catastrophic conditions. It, it blew a forest over, dropped that forest into Spirit Lake, and that is forming a petrified forest currently. And so this way they've been able to go back to Yellowstone and look at Specimen Ridge and Specimen Creek and go, ha, this is how it was formed, that these were actually ripped and put in place underwater and then petrified in place. And also, they figured out this is how coal is formed. The people that believe in evolution believe that coal is formed for millions and millions of years and all these swamps one on top of the other. But you know what? As these trees banged around on the top of the water, that dropped all their bark off while they were still banging around on the top of the water, and that all goes to the bottom. And then eventually the trees themselves would fall out at different levels depending on when they fell out. And so they would be covered. And as that's covered, if there's any heat still underneath here, it very quickly can make coal. Because that's what it takes to make coal and oil is these organic materials and then heat and pressure. And as you have other things banging down on top of them and you have any heat below them, then you have the heat and the pressure required. And so that explained where coal could be deposited. And look at the polystrata tree. Can you see there's a... Uh, uh, on the far bottom right of this picture, there is a hammer to give you scale. That's a polystrata tree found in coal. Oil. You can make oil, oil, crude oil, in a couple of, uh, a, a couple of days using raw sewage, believe it or not. They can do that. Yeah, you never hear about that because that's going to undermine a lot of people's control. Interestingly, the first time I lectured on that in a Sunday school classroom, the lady came up to me after and said, my father worked on that project. I know that's true. And I was like, wow. So I, I know. Well, you won't hear about it because they don't want us to know that stuff. And crude oil is coming up out of the bottom of the ocean. Uh, it seeps out of the bottom of the ocean in certain places. That's why that picture is so bad because it's at the bottom of the ocean. But... Uh, and it's funny, when they carbon-14 date the oil, it's not as old as, you know, it's, it, it's like between 20 and 50,000 years old, and we talked about that last, yesterday. Um, how would you get something like Grand Canyon? Well, we got Engineers Canyon and Lewitt Canyon um, by erosion from Mount St. Helens. And actually, it made a miniature version of the Grand Canyon. It's called the Little Grand Canyon, cut out over 100 feet deep of sheer rock in just one day. All it took was a mudslide from the volcano, and it literally cut out the rock 100 feet deep in one day, and they watched it happen. So where did Grand Canyon come from? Well, at the end of the flood, when God upwarped the mountain ranges on either side of the United States, you had water caught in there. And as the water was receding, it receded out to the west and it cut out that big hole. Now, Grand Canyon is a scientific fact. You can see it, smell it, taste it here and touch it. Scientific fact. How it got there is an interpretation. The evolutionists will tell you that the Colorado River cut out that big hole over a very long, slow period of time. A little bit of water, long period of time. We look at it and go, no, that was a big amount of water 
over a very short period of time. They just ripped out out of there. And the trick is this, if they were right, if the Colorado River cut that out, it means the Colorado River had to go a mile uphill. 